All right, well, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to the final event in our 2022 speaker series. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker this morning. Um, but before I do, I want to give a few uh, preliminary comments on how our, her work is situated in our genetics uh, portfolio. Um, as many of you know, our overarching goal uh, for our funding and, and really biomedical research uh, more broadly is to minimize or eliminate um, physical suffering um, or mental suffering. And uh, of course, as many of you know, the recent advances in um, gene editing technologies have uh, given us an unprecedented level of uh, power to manipulate our own biology. And it's now to the point where gene editing technologies, even our household name, everybody seems to know what CRISPR-Cas9 is. Um, and it's a part of public debate, lots of journalists writing about it. Um, in, in my experience, uh, in academic circles or otherwise, a lot of the, the ethical conversations and considerations about the appropriate use of the, of the technologies are often focused on feasibility and safe use of the technologies. Um, and, and while that's perfectly appropriate, um, a lot of times they lead to, to thinner kinds of conversations um, where there isn't really a thoughtful uh, reflection on the kinds of criteria and considerations for whether we ought to use them and how we ought to intervene in our own uh, shared sense of human future. Um, part of the reason why you don't see that in scientific circles is, of course, because these are questions that science really can't bear upon, right? They're, they're found in the domain of the humanities. Um, this idea of ontologically, you know, who are we and who might we become? What does it mean for us to flourish as a society? Um, and, and so the domains of social, cultural, religious communities that, that really can be brought to bear are, in many cases, unfortunately, not a part of the conversation. Um, they don't really have a seat at the table and are given part of the due process. So our speaker today, uh, Sheila, um, is, is really... Uh, been for decades at the forefront of considering what are the limits of knowledge in this space um, and, and trying to thicken the discourse around uh, who we are and who we might become and, and perhaps even tapping into the acquired wisdom of these other uh, traditions and fields of research. Um, in my experience, she's a genuinely contrarian person as well as being a pioneer. And every time I've ever heard her speak up in meetings, I've come away with it being very constructive and genuinely wise in, in the perceptions that she brings to bear. And so I, I'm a big fan, have been for a long time. I'm really thankful that you've come, Sheila. Let me just say a few things about your background and then I'll get out of the way so you can speak. Um, uh, Sheila Jasnoff is uh, the Forsheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at, at Harvard. Uh, she came to Harvard in 1998, I believe, prior to that was at Cornell. In both locations, she uh, spearheaded uh, the STS uh, programs or departments that are reflected there. Um, in her decades of work, she's authored many, many articles. I think it's over 130. Um, she's authored 15 books and counting, I'm sure. Um, and as a result of that, has many, many different awards. The most notable, perhaps, is this year, uh, she was the recipient of the Holberg Prize, which is the um, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for the Humanities. So we're in for a real treat this morning. Uh, Sheila, I'd like to welcome you um, and, and thank you again for, for talking with us. Thank you, Kevin, for the incredible generosity on both fronts from the Templeton Foundation and your personal in introduction. Um, so I always feel I have to begin by repudiating uh, much of what's said because it's not um, well contrarian. I mean, in some sense, contrarian depends on where you position yourself. And I think I'm quite mainstream from the standpoint of the fields that I was trained in. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but also the pioneering. I mean, it's a sort of collective enterprise. And I think the theme I want to stress today is that what we're trying to do with this observatory project that the Templeton Foundation is funding is restore more of a sense of collective enterprise to the management of, and steering of science. But let me walk you through it with a slideshow to start with, and then I'm very much looking forward to the 
Q&A afterwards. And thank you all for being here from whatever time zone and for um, sharing in this conversation today. Um, so let me share my screen and proceed from there. It's, um, it's always a problem sort of figuring out how to dilute or compress um, one's um, decades of work that Kevin has talked about into something not much more than a half hour of, um, of formal presentation, but let me try to go through it um, with some major points. So what is our observatory project trying to do in the context of the kind of um, decades of shared scholarship that I and my colleagues have been doing now for, in, in my case, really almost approaching 40 years at this point. And I think it's putting the human back into the center of questions about the value of science and technology and how do we best do that? And, and let me, um, um, proceed to say something about where these perspectives are coming from. Um, so, um, for some reason it wasn't advancing. Um, Okay, so there are, of course, some organizing academic ideas, and this is just a pointer that um, three notions will be coming through in the talk. One is that humanness today, because of the technological interventions that are possible, is distributed. It's no longer the phenotypic human that uh, da Vinci was concerned with that sits at the center, but multiple representations of humanness. Then this idea of humility, which I'll come back to towards the end, which of course plays a major part in the Templeton Foundation's thinking, and I'm sure in all of yours as well. And last but not least, questions of deliberation and governance, which are central to democracy theory, but have not been applied in the context of steering science and technology in any kind of consistent way. So the starting point for our project, the Global Observatory for Genome Editing, comes from these ideas. So where do sensibilities about human life come from? Well, for, from science for sure, but not only from science. And therefore a scientific revolution almost as a corollary has to be revolutionary for other loci as well. And then I won't bother to read this quotation aloud, but it's from a collected work called Reframing Rights, where we began thinking about the constitutional implications of changes in science and technology. And that is a line of work that feeds into our Templeton project and is at the core of it in some ways. Um, so people know what the double helix is. I mean, in since 1953, an idea that was once a scientific uh, novelty now is in popular culture, and there's hardly any educated person in this country, you know, even with a high school education, to whom you could give that double helix image who would not have some idea that it's DNA. But one thing I want to point out with this slide is that while DNA itself in the physical state or in the scientific state can have a number of identities and itself serve as an identifier, that has corollaries in law and policy. And these are concurrent. I mean, it's not just that it's the one thing and you treat it that way, but it's but the DNA is simultaneously um, implicated in all of these different physical representations and concurrent legal and policy implications and consequences. So just to take one thing, of course, we know that it's an individual identifier. We talk about a person's genome and genomic characteristics. But with that come questions about what happens when that identifier gets out in the public domain or leaves your body and becomes something else. And so it is implicated in all sorts of privacy concerns, potential misuse, for instance, in employment situations, in the criminal legal system. So there's a wide variety of legal and policy implications that go hand in hand with different ways in which DNA shows up as a physical thing. 
Um, so this, it's popular to say that science and technology are moving rapidly, but this slide simply shows you some of the places where the, the advances in science and technology are putting the question of, well, what is the human um, really into circulation? So I picked an image of the chimera for this slide because a lot of the developments are in fact happening in zones where we don't know uh, what the future of um, um, the manipulable human will look like. So recently I was in a, an ethics committee that I sit in and there was a discussion about developments in creating organoids, a term that scientists don't like because they think it triggers sci-fi ideas in people's minds. Um, but people were talking about the fact that in this particular experiment that people were doing, uh, there would be no uh, cognitive implications because unlike the first headline you see about human brain cells grow in rats, this system was never going to produce a brain-like item. It would, And the scientists in question kept saying, this is going to be from the neck down. And, you know, Kevin and my contrarian guys, I asked whether from the neck down is an is a sufficient concern or not. <laughs> and a scientist on the committee said that this person would feel quite um, concerned about masses of human-like organisms, even if they were from the neck down. But it was not something that people were thinking about till, till I put that question into circulation. So, but these frontiers are rapid moving. And of course, they bear on the alleviation of suffering, which was one of the things that Kevin began his introduction with. So how have we regulated the frontiers of technology? And a little bit of regulatory history is in order here. So the principle that governed through much of the 19th, through much of the 20th century was the technologies of frontiers, risk happens at these frontiers, we can contain the risks. And in a way it's sort of parallel that the political risk containment of communism went hand in hand with risk containment in sectors like the nuclear. But there was very much a presumption that we can identify the risks and we can contain them by building walls around them of different sorts. But by the beginning of this century, it became clear that the technologies we favor, we favor them because they cannot be contained and in a sense should not be contained. So this is a very anonymous report that I don't know how many people in this audience are even aware of, but it was very influential in science policy circles. And it, it's called the NBIC idea of convergence because it stated that nanotech, biotech, information tech, and cognitive science are going to fold in together and that the advances of these coming decades of this century will be in areas where there will be all kinds of convergence and expansion and all sorts of um, individual and group traits and qualities will be enhanced by allowing these technologies to um, flow into each other. So obviously the idea of containment makes little sense if this is the vision of where the frontiers are. So these technologies are in a way, since it's popular in the humanities to stick post after everything or before everything, we can call these post containment technologies. And they have these properties. They're capable of diffusion, of penetration, of pervas pervasiveness, and particularly in the case of both DNA and artificial intelligence, also of evolution. So these are technologies that we value and prize, partly because they escape the regulatory structures that we thought were adequate in the 20th century. So what do we do about them? Well, so supposing we begin with the end point rather than the beginning point. So this is something that 
STS, Science and Technology Studies, my field has been pushing. Don't look only at the production of the technology, the beginning of the pipeline, but also look at the endpoints. So what are the endpoints and what do we seek to preserve, protect, value, and raise above other things? Well, humanism is still in vogue in some sense, but what is the human when technologies are converging and testing the limits at every point? So the questions on the right-hand side, ending with the who decides, are newly on the table, newly on the table because science and technology are altering some of the foundational presumptions of classic law, classic constitutionalism, classic political theory in a sense. Well, so one of the ideas that is very powerful is that of course we should try to set things right. And so where there are imperfections, if science and technology enable us to go after those imperfections, we should perfect them and try to correct for them. But a thing that is important to point out is that these ideas of perfection themselves are situated in culture and in society. So this image is MIT Technology Review's first cover story on CRISPR, household word that it has now become, and we can now engineer the human race. But you'll notice that there's a very particular image of the human race that they chose. And even the critics, sort of critical uh, public oriented observers of this technology or this suite of technologies take perfectibility somewhat for granted. So the Center for Genetics and Society, which is based out in San Francisco and is one of the most reputable centers that's following these technologies critically. In their FAQs, they say, will parents be able to engineer their children to be smart, tall, and blue-eyed? And one might ask, well, why these particular uh, visions of what the ideal human should be? I mean, why is it that blue-eyedness, when the vast majority of the world is not blue-eyed, becomes you know, almost so taken for granted that even the critics are imbued with this idea that blue-eyed is the endpoint of human enhancement. They, of course, end up saying there's ample reason to be concerned, but they're not concerned about why even the critics are picking this particular endpoint as a legitimate aim of perfectibility. So these are the things that one wants to question when looking back over the governance of science, not just science governing itself, but how we are governing science. And that history goes back you know, quite a long time. One can argue that it has to do in part with crossing the lines of funding. I mean, so that image of Craig Venter is very well known of him shown wearing a lab coat on the one side of his body, um, but, um, a businessman's jacket on the other side of his body. And he literally embodied this conversion by moving from the National Institutes of Health to form his own very lucrative private sector company that was a model for how science ought to behave um, in the future. And today we know that there are many, um, that it is an encouraged thing for science and universities to have um, uh, commercial tie-ins as well. So again, moving further back in time, where do our governance ideas come from? And in this case, there's a historical precedent and a place. So the Asilomar meeting house back in the 1970s, around 1975, was the locus of a very important meeting among people who were or were shortly to become Nobel laureates. And they came up with a vision of self-regulation that to this day governs the sciences. And I want to spend the bulk of the remainder of our time um, just um, talking about what the implications of Asilomar have been as the biological sciences have moved further and further into possibilities for manipulating the human. So David Baltimore, who was present as a young man in that previous picture today is one of the acknowledged um, um, 
doyens of the scientific community, and he was involved in setting up a system of governance that's called International Summits on Human Gene Editing or Genome Editing. The third summit is going to take place in March of the coming year, just in a few months, and we've been invited to talk about the observatory at that summit, and I'd be happy to talk about more details in the Q&A section. Um, but the first international summit was held in 2015. Uh, the second one held in 2018 was the one where He Jian Hui uh, unveiled his um, uh, so-called experiment uh, engineering um, the genomes of uh, two, or it turned out three babies before they had been born. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So the idea of self-regulation has expanded, if anything, to global dimensions, and now it's international and it's summits and the scientific community gets together and decides on principles of governance. So this, the top of this slide is taken from a talk that my own medical school dean, George Daly, who is an incredibly thoughtful scientist and science administrator that, that he likes to show. And what's important in this is to recognize that there's a sliding scale that scientists themselves acknowledge between things that we should go ahead with and things that we absolutely should not do. The question mark is about, well, how do the two ends of the scale line up together? And they both have implications, both ends of the scale. And that's what I'll talk about in a little more detail now. But the argument I want to make is that the way that the sliding scale has been interpreted thus far, interestingly, whether your traffic light is pointing at the yellow end or at the red end, the governance implications have ended up looking rather similar. That's a paradox. And that's what I want to lay out for the next couple of minutes. So the first idea is that science should have a green light. And there are certain conventional assumptions and arguments that go with that, that science, after all, makes the breakthroughs. And ethical deliberation should come second because people are unprepared, but that eventually public understanding and acceptance follow because ethics lags behind science, because Publics are ignorant, often afraid of new technologies. This is demonstrated or supposedly demonstrated by a lot of findings in cognitive and behavioral sciences. And again, I'd be happy to talk more about that if anybody is interested. But together with this idea that science makes breakthroughs is a construction of the public as not knowing enough. And therefore, progress requires science to be pushing the envelope. But this has implications for democracy that are almost too obvious to mention, that if ethics is second, then science decides not only the rules of the game for science, but also what counts as social and moral progress. And then there's a kind of inevitability to the nature of the change. Um, so the He Jian Kui experiment fits almost perfectly within this description. So Chinese researcher claims first gene editing as if science was entitled. And, you know, the image is interesting because it shows, in a sense, what I was describing, that the scientist looks in the mirror, the mirror of ethics, the mirror of morality, what is it? But what he sees is himself. And then headlines often capture a lot of wisdom, though often they also don't, but genetically modified babies were inevitable. So this idea of inevitability is in the narration of what happened. So a second position is hold steady until somebody from the outside society creates rules. And the conventional assumptions here are that, well, science comes first, but then ethical deliberation, which should produce evaluation and certification of right ways to do science, comes second anyway. The rule of ethics is to set the rules and set the limits that science will abide by. And then if science follows the rules, research will be ethical and responsible. But this also has constraining implications for democracy, that science comes 
first, and therefore science's own self-regulatory apparatus sets the limits of the moral imagination. And deliberation typically in these ethics bodies happens behind closed doors or guarded doors. There's not full democratic accountability. And there's a lack of mechanisms to reflect the range of public values and ethical judgment. So I myself sit on an ethics committee appointed by the provost of my university. And although I'm very grateful to him for being able to sit there, you know, I'm not exactly a representative of lay opinion. And, you know, it's a very enclosed expert body that is making determinations about things that concern a wide variety of people and circumstances. So the third possibility going down that sliding scale is that science should slow down or stop. But even here, the self-regulatory impetus has put ethics in the subordinate role. So this is driven by the idea that the public or the democratic impetus is ignorant and fearful. This comes up repeatedly in our conversations with scientists and in their public pronouncements as well. And therefore, science should hold back in an effort to educate and inform the public. And holding back is a way of acting responsibly. But so science has an obligation to predict and anticipate the social implications and therefore set the agendas for governance. So again, the implications for democracy are that the scientific community now controls not only the throttle, the full steam ahead, but also the brakes. When should we pause? This is reflected in calls for moratoria, which have accompanied genome editing, but also accompanied the Asilomar conference on gene editing back in the 1970s. So for 50 years, there's been this notion that science determines when there should be a pause, but pause for what is not discussed. I mean, it's like the two years of a moratorium are a break in themselves, but what are the opportunities for actually thinking in that time and how should we think and according to what ideas? And then, you know, ironically holding back just produces more pressures for moving ahead yet more vigorously um, when uh, the time comes. And the second international summit is actually an illustration of that, but I won't um, go into details. I'd be happy to say more during the Q&A. So all of this raises questions for democracy. I mean, if all roads lead to science setting the agenda for democracy, then we need to go back to basics about democracy itself. And democracy has a certain set of guiding questions, and it's important to re-ask them in the context of scientific and technological development. So who sets the agenda? Who's at the table? Who speaks for whom? And of course, who decides? The Global Observatory is driven by these concerns. And let me say at the outset that it is not just me. So my two co-directors are um, Ben Hurlbut at Arizona State, who uh, doesn't have quite the same number of years, but certainly an intensity of commitment to this research field. He is um, not second to me. And our third member is himself, a scientist, a working scientist who works on stem cells. This is Krishanu Saha, and he's at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, which is where some of the stem cell breakthroughs of the 1990s, the initial breakthroughs happened. So he is a biological engineer, but he is incredibly well-informed and savvy. And so the three of us form uh, an interesting group of three leading um, an enterprise that actually has many colleagues throughout the world who are involved in it in various ways. So the guiding principles for the observatory are that in order to widen the debate and to not have all roads leading back to science setting the agenda, we need to be international, interdisciplinary, and cross-sectoral. And we need to do it by broadening conversations. And the aims are an idea of inclusive deliberation that draws on imaginations of what the science and technology should be achieving for us, but based on experiences that are not only the experiences of the lab. We aim 
it's been, of course, delayed and stalled by the pandemic, but we aim to um, be one of the catalyzing elements in a global dialogue on the foundations for what our new idea is for the observatory, which is how to develop a foundation for a truly cosmopolitan ethics. And that has to be grounded in an idea of multiplicity, that the pathways forward are not unitary, that they're multiple, but how do we excavate these through our work? And here I come to an idea that I myself have authored and have been immersed in thinking about for a long time. It, it's interesting that, you know, while science and technology are incredibly promissory and in that sense, hubristic, even within the sciences and certainly outside the sciences, there remains a deep sense that we need to approach our own capability with humility. And my article has been, um, it's one of the most cited of my articles. It's interesting that my two most cited articles are about the imagination and about humil humility. So we can make what we want to make of that. But from this one page version that I wrote in science, a while, I mean, sorry, in nature a while ago, you see that I've been thinking about the multiplicity of pathways for a very long time. So this was explicitly saying that it's not about to be or not to be, it's about how to be and why to be and restoring those kinds of questions back on the agenda of um, human deliberation and democratic um, participatory discussion. So science and technology, we claim, produce certain kinds of lock-ins for the human imagination. And yet by doing the sorts of things that we want to do, we think that there are remedies to every lock-in. And I'll just go through these. So the initial framing of a question, like is enhancement about blue eyes, uh, reduces the range of options and ideas that people are thinking of. But one can get around the narrowing of framing choices by building recursion into processes, by building ways of revisiting those initial commitments. And for each of the things I'm going to be talking about, there actually are good examples of where people are attempting to do this. And again, I don't want to talk about the examples right now, but I'd be happy to elaborate if anybody's interested. Another place of narrowing is delegation. So I've already mentioned that I, for instance, am delegated to represent a certain cross-section of Harvard opinion on this ethics committee, but who does the delegation and how are the experts who are selected by delegation themselves held accountable? So the the antidote, if you will, to delegation is participation, and that has different norms. And how does one ensure a diversity of publics? I mean, all of these things raise their own questions. These are not formulaic on either side of my little boundaries that I'm setting up. Science happens in measurement, and it's, you know, almost, you know, I could create my own little measure for when in a conversation with scientists will quantification come up? When will they say, but do you have any numbers? It's interesting how many conversations lead to that. But the humanistic response has been, tell stories. And I think the STS response, the response that science and technology studies would like to give is, well, measurement is itself a narrative, but let's set other narratives. I was happy to hear Kevin using the word thin because it's a favorite word in our kind of work as well, that narratives can be thickened and the measurement narrative needs other narratives to um, offset it and in some sense counterbalance it, consistent with this idea of technologies of humility. Materiality is a very powerful lock-in. We build something and then it stays built, but people who are designing the materiality can also be thinking about reversibility. So what is doable and undoable? So human genome editing, when it's in the germline and gets passed on through generations, is less undoable than human genome therapy that goes after the biological organism once its genome is already 
in existence and and the the sperm cell the the reproductive uh, sperm and ova will not be affected. Um, so that is a more reversible technology to go in with somatic cells, cells that are already differentiated, than to go in at the level of heritable genome editing. So that's one example from the biological domain. And then last but not least, this is where the conceptual dimensions come into play. Science and technology are continually presenting us with imaginations, imaginations of progress, imaginations of a future that will be better than the past. I'm a woman. I am from the global south. Um, I live and work in the global north. I'm not confronting the year 2023 thinking that it holds more promise than when I first became a sentient being or a scholar sometime in the 60s and 70s. So the imaginations held forth then are not the realities of now. And how do we deal with that? Well, I mean, it's no secret to anybody that autocracies are on the rise. If you look at the, the autocracies of the world today, most of them are led by male leaders. I mean, so it's not a happy time for the kind of progress that was imagined you know 50 years back or 70 years back and after the first after the last world war so a multiplicity of visions therefore seems essential and that is something that we are of course committed to where do we teach and learn and i'll end on a personal note because my professional instruction was in law, and I'm one of the few people in science and technology studies with a deeply ingrained vision of law. And to this day, when I go past Harvard Law School, I look up at Austin Hall, which you see there, and I see the biblical um, uh, extract that is uh, written up above what Moses's father-in-law said to him. Um, and the teaching is, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. So the pedagogical enterprise is something that is quite central to the work that we do, but we approach it in all humility ourselves, because we don't have the right answers. We only have a way of illuminating multiple possible pathways to possible answers. And with that, let me Thank you and stop sharing and um, open the way to discussion. Thank you.